In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking to Professor Catherine Hayhoe about how her recent book, Saving Us, addresses issues relating to personal agency. 2022 has advanced out of the gate with threats of war, massive volcanic eruptions, economic and political upheavals, conspiracy theories, and the worsening, accelerating degradation of the biosphere upon which we are all entirely reliant. Awareness is growing and people from all walks of life are awakening to the need for emergency action. It now feels like we're simply being held back by an adherence by the few to the value systems and aspirations of the last century. Thank you for listening to Climate Gen. We have a programme of interviews for this year looking at the multifaceted problem of rebalancing life in the biosphere. Please do subscribe and be sure to comment or send me your feedback by email. You can also support this series via Patreon at patreon.com slash gencc. Thank you. So Catherine, it's fantastic to see you. And I'm going to dive straight in. 2021 has ended like a cliffhanger. The UK is in turmoil. Putin is threatening Ukraine. COP26 ended with insufficient policy action. COVID is still causing havoc and the world seems very divided. If we go back to the COP, it was the first time I witnessed a sort of palpable anger and persistent demonstration of unguarded feelings from people outside the restricted zones. And the energy in the blue zone felt like it, it felt a kind of business as usual. There were great things happening, but these were disconnected from the failing political negotiations that are meant to define the meaning of the event. Does this sound familiar to you in the experience you had? And how much do you think all of this this matters? It does, but I would say that there was definitely emotion inside the blue zone as well. So many country negotiators are people who are very concerned about climate change. Even you know, young people are, are country negotiators. There were many representatives of indigenous nations and tribes and peoples. There were a lot of representatives of NGOs, um, of nonprofits and charities, people who are disproportionately affected by climate change. So I would say that there was significant emotion inside. In fact, <clears throat> I did uh, one of the TED countdown events with two Buddhist monks, and they said that they were just there at COP to walk around. And of course, they're wearing their robes, so everybody know there's, know, knows that they're monks. And they said that people would just stop them and say, why are you here? And they say, we're just here to support people. And they said people would just burst into tears and start crying and said that they felt so desperate, so hopeless, so frustrated, so angry. And they would just sit with people and they would talk with people and they would meditate with people and pray with people. And so I feel like this this emotion is everywhere. And I've even seen it the last, I think probably about five or six years, I've seen it coming out in the scientific community where, you know, as scientists, we are the least emotional group of people on the planet. Yet I've started to see um, presentations at scientific conferences called Are We Aft? They had to start out for, you know, <laughs> to put it in the scientific program. Um, I've started to see fellow scientists express their anxiety, their fear, their frustration, their anger. Um, a lot more scientists have become a lot more verbal and vocal on social media or writing op ads or doing podcasts or YouTube episodes. I mean, I think all around us, the emotions are coming out because we see that we are not doing enough and we know what's happening. And do you think that, because I, I totally agree with what you're saying as well about the, the people I interview, there's a very different, I mean, before you, there was a lot of discussion among scientists whether they should show emotion. And now it's just sort of, it's just there and it's happening. It does feel that there's a, the comprehension by the engaged public. And I'm talking about mainly outside the COP, because every time you couldn't help but notice every time you walked out through the barriers, there was a, there was a sort of persistent, um, energy from protesters and, and people there to demonstrate. And the, the, the failure to ad address the issue is, is robbing the politicians of their agency. And people are getting mad and, and they are growing in number. And your book, um, which is also, I think I interpreted, it, it's a, a lot about agency in your book, yes. um, Saving Us, and how to realise that agency. But it's also, you cite the polling data on people's concern regarding climate is increasing in the majority, even in the US, which before wasn't the case. How much of your work now is moving from trying to convince people it's real to discussion around how to channel these emotions and anxieties that arise from realizations about climate and ecological issues? Oh, I think you've absolutely put your finger on it. I would say, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, 
80% of what I did was convincing people that it was real and important. So some people might say it's real, but they didn't think it was important. So most of what I did was convincing people it was real or it mattered. And then now I think it's totally flipped. Now the vast majority of people um, anywhere. So in the United States, 70% of people are worried about climate change. In the UK and Canada, it's more like 75 to 80%. In France, it's 85%. The majority of people are worried about climate change already, but they feel hopeless and helpless. They don't know what to do. There is no sense of agency. And so that is literally why I wrote my book, because the number one question that I as a climate scientist have got over the last four years, almost every day sometimes, is what gives you hope? And what can I do about it? That's what everybody wants to know. And it's so important because if all of us agreed that it's real and it's serious, but we didn't know what to do about it, so we did nothing, that ends up with the same result as if we didn't think it was real. Yeah. The biggest yeah. gap is not between the people who do or don't accept the science. The biggest gap is between those of us who are worried and those of us who are activated. Okay. And this kind of... This it links back, I think, to the to the I'd say to the COP, but it, more generally speaking, in in the UK, in the US, we've got these sort of bitter divisions. But we also have um, I'm going to use the UK as an example. We ha we have this sort of crazy government <laughs> that's going against everything it said it was going to do. Mm -hmm. And in Germany is a good example. The former chancellor is now a director of Rosneft. You've got the former French, French prime minister, who's the director of CIBA, these sort of big, massive uh, petrochemical companies. And the media, and it also links back to this recent movie, Don't Look Up, where we had uh, this sort of a very big observation of the disconnect between media, but the media is connected to the businesses and the politics. And there's this merry-go-round that is disconnected from all of this feeling that we feel. Are we getting to a point with this rising sense of, I would say, agency and uh, emotion in the public and the disconnect between what we might call an elite class, mm -hmm. where eventually somehow we're going to have to confront it. The, the, it's going to sort of say, we can't carry on like this. Mm -hmm. uh, do, what, what are your thoughts on that, of how we, how we confront this issue of not making progress when everybody now knows that we have to? The, the image that comes to my mind is like water building up behind a dam. So often I hear from people who are frustrated and angry and hopeless. They say, look at all that you've done. Look at all everything else, everybody else has done and nothing's changed. Nothing's happened. So why bother? Well, they're assuming that you could see incremental change, that if I spend X hours advocating for climate solutions, you will see Y reduction in carbon emissions, as if there's a linear relationship between what we do to advocate for solutions and how carbon emissions get reduced. But that's not the way it works. I think a better metaphor is like, imagine all this water from the floodwaters building up behind a dam and there's more and more pressure on the dam. And the dam is standing and the dam is our current policies, our current energy system, our current economy. The dam is standing because it has some strength, but it's not used to having that much pressure on it. And then one day after, you know, hours and weeks and days of pressure on that dam, so to speak. And, you know, in terms of climate solutions, we're talking about like years of pressure. One day, all of a sudden you see a little crack. And then all of a sudden some water starts to pour out the other side. And then the crack gets widened. And then they're like, you have one hour to get out of the way before the entire dam collapses. <laughs> and I sort of feel like we're heading for that moment in a good way, if that makes sense, rather than a bad way. We want that dam to collapse. We want everything that's standing in the way of climate action to, to be washed away. But the only way for that to happen is to build up that pressure. And sometimes we just feel like I've been pushing as hard as I can for years and I don't see anything happening. And that's why, as I talk about in my book, it's so important to practice active hope, to go and to look at all the other people whose hands are on that boulder pushing it or on the dam, so to speak, to look at all the changes that are happening in the world around us, to look at companies that are making a difference, cities that are making a difference, organizations that are making a difference, individual people who are making a difference, to realize that we're not alone, to look at sort of the graph of how the pressure on the dam has built over time and to realize, you know what, change is happening. Yeah, yeah, and you do talk a lot about that in the book and it is extremely noticeable now about how many people are doing absolutely fantastic things mm -hmm. and very and very uh, truly hopeful things. And yet there's this, this top layer 
that seems completely <laughs> disconnected. But um, yes. climate science research is now a seeming cascade of warnings, but also actual impacts. And in our interview a year ago, you, you said climate scientists have been lowballing climate forecasts. Is there now a link between what you're saying in your book regarding saving us and perhaps a subtitle that also sort of said, <laughs> get ready. I mean, <laughs> are we ready? And how do we organize it? Because this is a, this is becoming an important discussion, I think. It is. Well, since we last spoke, there has just been this string of extreme events that when scientists look at this from an attribution perspective are so far beyond what we even expected at this point of time that it's hard to put numbers on it. So the the massive heat wave in British Columbia and Washington State and Oregon in Western North America this summer was at least 150 times more likely because of climate change, at least. But really, it's hard to put a number on it. Um, the extreme heat in the Arctic and Siberia, the, um, you know, the, the crazy rainfall events that have been happening, the wildfires that have been burning acres and, you know, millions of acres, um, not just the Australian ones just before COVID, but the ones out west in the United States, the ones in Greece this summer. So we've seen even more extreme events that are even further out to the tails of the distribution than our climate models are able to go. Um, they're happening here. They're happening now. They're affecting us today. Wow. Yeah. And um, I just want to go back to to the, the COP and the fact that we're now um, we're moving towards this Egyptian COP. And I think this is I found this really interesting from a previous interview. The, this is shaping up as an, dubbed an African COP and also a, a lot of emphasis on vulnerable nations. And yet I've heard people in the UK who are quite despairing about the outcome so far of, up to COP26 saying we should just boycott this and we should just avoid it. And I get that. But part of me is also saying, well, hang on a minute, you know, these guys can't just boycott or avoid it because vulnerable nations don't actually have anywhere to go. How do you think about that in terms of working with us, what's seemingly a, a broken system, but also trying to show solidarity in a way to, to those that are, are now hosting it, if you like? And who, again, as you pointed out, are among some of the most vulnerable people on the planet because climate change is a threat multiplier. It takes poverty, lack of access to resources, even issues like gender equity and um, stable political systems. It takes all of these issues or instable political systems and exacerbates them or makes them worse. Yeah. Well, I have to say that um, after COP, one of the things that discouraged and sort of frustrated me was the way that um, people we're so desperate for hope that we often put our hope in the wrong things. And then when those things fail us, as they always do, they could be a specific piece of legislation, they could be a specific politician, or they could be a specific meeting or event. We put all our eggs in one basket. We hope against hope that this will be what will fix it. And when the politician does not live up to what they promised, when this legislation does not accomplish everything it said it would, when the meeting doesn't meet our expectations, then we just turn on it and we say, well, it was no good. It was worse than nothing. And it's like, no, you were here and now you're here. And so maybe you were expecting to climb to the top of Everest, but you at least made it to the base camp and the base camp is better than where you were before, which was nowhere. So, so with COP26, it was the 26th conference of parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Who in their right mind expected meeting number 26 to miraculously solve all our problems. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's just not what it was created to be. The goal of COP26, literally the goal, was to agree on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. That was the goal, and they did it. But they did more than that. They had all kinds of statements about phasing down coal, originally it was supposed to be phasing out coal, right? phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. Fossil fuels were mentioned for the first time. There were deforestation agreements. There were all kinds of additional agreements that came out in, in, in excess of simply agreeing to Article 6. So if you looked at it objectively of what was the purpose of COP on the books, did they accomplish it? They did. Did they accomplish more than they said they were going to? They actually did. But the problem is, is 
we are so far down the tracks that the objectives of the COP itself are not enough. So that's what people are responding to. But knowing that the objectives were not enough, why would you expect it to fix climate change? So we have to up our ambition for the cops. And they're part of the reason they're failing us is because they just don't have the ambition. And why don't they have the ambition? We have never had every country in the world agree to phase out the primary source of its economy and energy before. I mean, we are asking the near impossible of the world. And that's why this is so challenging. But we can't afford not to because what's at stake is our civilization as we know it. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense? Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely makes sense. Yeah. And I, I'm, um, I've come away from the COP with, a, with an overriding sense that it is never really going to solve the problem. No. And the, what the good thing is, is that it's become a, it's a kind of annual think tank <laughs> or something. For, it is, for yes. the movement and we don't really have anything else no. and okay I might not go to ones that are on the other side of the planet but I will try to go to ones where I can um yeah and, and support it and be and especially support those people who desperately need it probably more than I do I think I need it much, as much as anyone else but, yeah. but you know <laughs> we, it, all do. Yes. <laughs> we all do but uh, there are those who are on the front lines and I think in that sense, the solidarity thing does seem to come through and, and matter a lot. You're, um, you're totally right. So it's gotten to the point now with COPS where the official negotiations are only a tiny fraction of what happens. And the fact that you have Amazon and Microsoft and Unilever and, you know, talking to each other about how they can do more to cut their emissions. I mean, those 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 are the size of large, large countries, the emissions of those types of global multinationals. And so it is an opportunity for all these different organizations. I mean, there were, you know, the Rotary Club, medical associations, um, theologians, students, grandparents. Um, you know, relief and development organizations, um, everybody was there and everybody was there to talk about what they could do. And so ironically, as a climate scientist, I spend so much of my time looking at the doom and gloom. I came into COP with very low expectations. So I came in not putting my hope in COP at all. I had I had virtually no hope um, going that, that, that COP would, you know, make significant strides forward. Yeah. But I came away encouraged not because of what the actual formal negotiation process itself accomplished, but because I talked to so many people there, and you did too, from all walks of life, from all spheres of influence, all of whom were incredibly concerned and incredibly activated. And for the first time, I actually saw the world at COP, not just the business leaders, not just the cities, not just the countries, I saw the world there. And finally, I felt that people are getting that climate change is a human issue and that to care about it, you only have to be one thing and that's a human. You can be from anywhere on the planet, you can be at any age, you can be from any walk of life, you can be from any socioeconomic condition, you can be from any sector of the economy. Um, you can have any expertise, but whoever you are, you are already the perfect person to care. And I saw that at this COP for the first time, and that gave me tremendous hope, not because of what governments were doing, but because people were activated. Yeah, sure. And there were some amazing events going on around Glasgow with, if you think about the, the from all kinds of disciplines, the river of contributions from books, podcasts, interviews, whatever, it was all being explored there in groups, meetings, and all kinds of things, which and things like citizens' assemblies. It's where new ideas get some traction and get start getting some, some development. So oh, that yeah. was that was pretty amazing. Cutting back now, going, going back to your book, actually, a key message I took from Saving Us as well it was this drive to bring us all on board, to be inclusive and united. And it's odd that we generally are happier and more contented when we are united and working mm -hmm. together. And yet today, division is mainstream. It's, it sort of doesn't make sense. You know, what are your sort of views on the pathways to healing? So it's really interesting because um, the book's subtitle is A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing. And really, the book is about how do we come together using climate change as an example. So climate change is sort of like the icing on the cake. And the cake itself is, how do we come together in a world where everything seems designed to push us further apart? Whether it's issues like Brexit, political polarization, um, you know, 
issues of vaccine inequity, issues of um, socioeconomic inequity. Um, everything seems designed to push us further apart these days. And divided we fall, all of us, because we all share this home. This, this planet is our home and we all share it. And you cannot put up giant walls to the top of the atmosphere around your city or your country or your business or your home. It just doesn't work that way. So what affects one of us affects all of us um, all around the world. We're all interconnected. And that's why it really is about saving us. And we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. And climate change is just one of the issues that we have to come together on. But climate change is arguably the most overarching issue because it threatens civilization as we know it. The yeah. planet will still be here. The question is, will civilization still be here? And the answer to that is up to us. Yeah, yeah. And being united weaves through all of the the issues of the day, I mean, every mm -hmm. single one of them, really. And OK, so my, my last question, in the face of the myriad threats at the outside of 2022 that we've been discussing, the political, the climate, et cetera, Aside from knitting and drinking wine, what else can we do to keep calm and carry on? You have me pegged, Nick. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I do. <laughs> In fact, I was just reading today, literally before we, we were talking with each other, how, how knitting is good for your mental health, how it reduces stress and increases your sense of well-being and allows for the release of serotonin. Um, and that's already and in course, there. That's on the list. Yes. And, and a glass of wine beside you does not hurt. No, <laughs> so, no. I can vouch for that. Yes. So um, I think it's really important to, well, for, first of all, let me back up and say, the answer to bringing us together is a really simple word, and that's love. Um, it's love of, it's the people we love, the places we love, the things that we love. That's why we're fighting. We're fighting for the things, the people, and the places that we love. And those are different for all of us. We all love different things. We love different people. We love different places. And that's great. But we all have something that we love. And that's why we're fighting. So a failure to address climate change is truly at its core a failure to love. And what do we need to do to recharge, to keep hope going for the long game is we need to remind ourselves of why we're fighting by doing the things that we love, by spending time with the people we love, by, I mean, in my case, I love the outdoors. I love paddle boarding. I love water. I love skiing. I love snow. I love skating. Um, I love knitting. I love wine. I love my friends and my family. I love reading. And so spending time with the people in the places doing the things that you love reminds you why this world is worth fighting for why it's worth charging back into the fray because of those things. So don't neglect those things. Don't feel like, you know, don't feel like you never have time to do those things because those things are what they charge our batteries. They keep us going and they remind us why we're all in this together. And they, they connect us, don't they? When we do these things, they connect us to the world around us. They connect us to nature. They connect us to the places we love. They connect us to the people that surround us. Um, and when it all comes down to it, truly what we have in common is more than what divides us. I know that for a fact, it isn't just an opinion. I know that we have more in common than what divides us. What divides us can seem so trivial when you think of, we all need air to breathe. We all need food to eat. We all need water to drink. Um, we, all, um, we all depend on this planet for everything we have. And that is what is at risk. That's what at stake. And so that means that every single one of us is already the perfect person to care about climate change because of who we are. Well, I'm not gonna add anything to that. And um, thank you very much. It's been fabulous as always, to, to speak to you. So have a fantastic 22, and I hope I'll see you along the track somewhere. I hope so too, Nick. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much you. for having me again. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.